Happy New Year, all. I am super excited today to kick off the year with my special guest, Deepa. She is an author, a consultant, and she's created something so new that I can't wait that we're going to get into. But I want to talk about your book first that's coming out, The First, The Few, The Onlys. Tell me about that. Yes. So it's about um, women of color in corporate America. And it comes from some of my own experience. I was a first and an only um, and really talks about what it's like to be a first if you were an only um, in different spaces. And by first, I mean the first in your family to go to college or the first in your family to work in a professional setting. Um, the fews, a lot of us tend to be the few in a department or in a space or in an organization. You know, there's a few others, but we're one of the few or the only, right? The, the only one in a company, the only one in the department. When I'm using it in the book, I'm usually referring to the only one in the C-suite. And so those experiences, as you know better than anybody, are very different, right? There's a lot of navigation, a lot of internal talk, a lot of things you process. And so that's what the book is about. I can just feel my, my skin tingling because I know I got a call, you know, I call it a calling a, a couple years ago when I, I started thinking about the onlys and we connected online. Uh, we haven't met before and I'm so excited at someday that we will. And there's these people that you resonate when you see something, hear something and you feel something. And I feel that with you. So I'm so excited to dive yeah. deep into this conversation with you. Yeah. But the onlys, right? Like, yeah. tell me, what does the power of the only mean to you? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I saw, so I felt the same way. I saw your profile. Someone had mentioned it to me. And then when I saw the onlys, I, I, I have to meet her. I have to talk to her. And so I'm so glad we're doing this. I have to say, though, you have really embraced when I read what you've written and what you talk about, the, the power of the only. And I think a lot of my journey was processing that and that there is power in being an only. Because mm -hmm. I actually think for a lot of my career, so I spent 22 years in corporate America. Yes. I just left in May, so very recently, um, and had a wonderful career. But there was a lot of being the only person in the room, right? The only person of color, the only woman, the only woman of color, um, not only in my company, but also in the, in the client. I serve. So I was a partner in a large consulting firm. I served tech and telecom clients. And so even in those clients, I tended to be the only woman to be candid with you. And I think I struggled a lot with imposter syndrome. I think I struggled a lot with conformity, like how much do you conform? How much can I show up as my true self? Yes. And so I think I now see power in the only, but I have to be honest, for a long time, it was a struggle. I think it was a lot of me wondering, and I used to say to myself, you don't have to see it to be it. And that was my mantra as I was coming up in the firm, yeah. right? It. Um, and so, yes, I think there's power now. And I think the power is we do things differently. I think there's an amazing opportunity for us to step into our leadership as yes. women of color and as onlys. And we haven't even seen that yet because we haven't really been given permission, um, both to ourselves and by others, to really step into that. And so that's what's exciting to me and where, where I think the power lies, even though maybe we're not seeing it yet. We're, we're on the precipice of it, I think. And I'm so excited that you say that because that's the conversation that I wanted to change. I come from two angles, not just the power of the only within yourself, because that's where the power has been before. It's like, okay, let's teach women how to speak. Let's teach us how to be empowered. And I think that's important. All of us need to step up, own our voice, own our power, show up and power presence representation. That's what I represent. That's what it's about. But now the conversation is, it's not just about, I want to see the power of myself. We have power that other people, and we add value. We add value that has not been seen before. And I know that that's what you feel and that's what you want to bring out. And that's the conversation that I want to shift. I come from an empowerment angle. Yes, it is on us to step up, but also it's not doing us a favor. It's not uh, diversity and inclusion as an initiative. It's actually, I bring this to the table and you haven't even understood what that whole big picture is. And I'm so happy and so honored that you're cracking that open even deeper because that's what I've always felt. Yeah, because I think a lot of us, you know, we didn't, I start with in the book, you know, that we didn't see ourselves growing up. I mean, I, you know, yeah. you, again, you and I haven't even talked and I feel like well, one day we'll grab a cup of coffee or wine. <laughs> But when you don't see yourself in structures, when you don't see yourself in the media, when you don't see yourself in books, you question, right? Do I belong? Who am I? You know, it, it's a very um, 
it's a very strange feeling that we don't often talk about. We don't really spend the time talking about that. What does that do to our psyche? What does that do to us as young girls? And then I think you get to school, right? And in some cases, yes, there's others, but even the curriculum, the things we're taught don't really leave space for our difference and talking about and valuing our difference. And I think we've gone through a lot, you know, and I also have to say it's different for different groups. That's what I found in my research. Mm. I was first generation, right? So I think, yes. um, you know, first generation kids usually, you know, rebel a little bit against their culture and then they come back to it. That's a pretty standard pattern. Yes. And, you know, then you enter the, enter the workforce and depending on what, what you pick and what you choose, I mean, you chose something similar to I did where there weren't a lot of women and there wasn't a lot of diversity. And so I didn't see it around me. So yet again, right, I'm not seeing reflected around me who I am and what I am and what's happening at home. And so you get a lot of conflicting messages about, you know, not, not necessarily sensing yourself, but like, how do you show up, right? What yes. parts of do I share? And so I think that's a real issue that a lot of us struggle with and go through. And so that is a lot of what the book is about. Like how, so how do we step past that? And the power of us, I think is so interesting because we're at a moment where I think the world is demanding a different kind of leadership, right? We're on the yes. precipice of environmental challenges. We're on the pre precipice of leadership challenges. And I think, you know, my belief is, and, and from talking, so I've spent the last, you know, many months talking to over 500 senior women of color. I think wow. we're asking really different questions. And I think because we've been marginalized or we're, because we are women and women of color and our voice hasn't always been heard like you described and we haven't been given full space to show up, I think a lot of us believe if we did have that space, we would lead differently, we would show up differently. And a lot of my work right now, I call it the power of me and the power of we, it's the power of yourself, but what is the power if we come together? Like what could we do together? Um, and we haven't really seen that. A lot of women of color, I think, um, have been isolated, right, obviously. Yes. And, and there's maybe small pockets of groups where women of color come together, but my work now is bringing us all together because by 2050, data suggests that we'll be the majority in the workforce. And if we are, you know, what does that mean for us? How do we want to show up? What's our legacy? I think those are amazing questions to ask. And I love all of this. And I want to dive deeper into your story, but I know you just brought up N Formation is a membership group that you're starting. So let's touch upon that. And then I go and I'll go deeper into your story because what we talked about is power, presence, and representation is what I stand for. And it's such a, an amazing thing about, right, seeing yourself and also in community. So tell me a little bit about information, what you're working on right now. When I decided I was going to leave corporate, you know, we'll get into the story on why and how and what, yeah. you know, it was a big decision to leave and it took me a few years to actually leave. I really decided I wanted to work on women of color issues. And this was prior to um, the pandemic of the summer, right? Meaning the racial pandemic and George, George Floyd's murder. It was prior to COVID. I was really kind of thinking I wanted to leave and do something else. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I think the last election really made me question, like, what am I doing in the world? Um, you know, yes. how am I contributing? Like, really, what's my purpose? And it wasn't a it wasn't a top of mind question, but it had been a growing question. It grew over the last four, four years. Yes. And so information is something I've started in addition to the book. Um, information I'm doing with my partner. Uh, her name is Ra Goddess, and I think you've actually met her, and she's wonderful. Um, she yeah, we did a, a diversity panel together <laughs> just a couple yeah. weeks ago, so we were all supposed to meet. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. And she was my coach for the last five years, helping me navigate, you know, um, do I want to stay or go? And what does purpose mean to me? And so that's how I met her. And we've just launched information. We just opened the wait list a few, um, a few months ago. And um, at the time of the podcast, uh, we'll, we will just be going live. So, you know, the, the wait list has been growing. And the idea is that women of color, professional women of color, need safe spaces, need brave spaces, and need new spaces. And the idea is we need spaces to come together and talk about the challenges we have at work, right? The microaggressions, yes. the being the onlys. We need brave space to talk about leading differently, you know, how we show our voice, how we find our voice. And then we need new space because structures need to change. And where is that conversation happening? So many women of color are being asked to lead right now and lead in inclusion, you know, programming, yes. in content, inclusion, and leadership. But a lot of us haven't had the full space to explore, again, what that is because we were kind of navigating within what existed, right? I feel like we're in a moment where anything is possible. Possible. But we need, again, the space to come together to talk about that. So that's what information is. It's an online app where women of color can come together. It's a fully vetted community. And then the idea is since once we started gathering those women uh, last summer, we got some feedback. If you're going to have these amazing women, we should also look at placing them on boards and in the C-suite. Yes. So the second thing we do is place women on boards and in the C-suite. But I have to say, I'm most excited about the community because for me, had I had that community, 
I think my career and my, you know, trajectory and even my self-confidence would have been different, you know, a long time ago. So, yeah. I'm so excited. And this is the moment, you know, and I know that you heard the call. Um, I told my husband a, a couple years, about a year ago, and I go, the whistle has gone out and those who hear the call know what I'm talking about. And he looked at me like, what? And I go, it's okay. And that's when the kind of the power of the only kind of channel, it really did, it channeled. And I go, I just know that when I start talking about this, the people that heard the call, it's happening right now. This is about a year and a half, two years ago. I go, it's starting right now. And I don't know what's going to happen and how it's going to show up and what's going to be put out there, but we're going to create something new. And he's like, I love it. Great. (laughs) Supportive. But I know you heard that. And it's like you said, it's been forming, creating, and now we're actually putting it into action. So I can't wait to see what you create with that, with information of actually taking that calling, that feeling and putting it into what other people have heard the call, right? And bringing us together to create something new. And, and I think that's the new conversation of now we're shifting the structures, right? Because first it does start within us. So I still come from a place of personal empowerment of like, you have the situation you have, if corporate's the way it is or the situation, but things are starting to shift and now we can step into that, but you have to be ready, right? When the structures shift, you have to be ready and you have to be ready before the structures shift. So I love what you're doing with that. I actually want to go deeper into, you know, your calling. Was there a moment where you started to shift into the power of the only away from the imposter syndrome into like, you know what, I got this. Was there a moment? And can you share more about that? You know, I um, spent a long time at the same firm. So, you know, it it was at one company, but I think it was when I became a manager. So I shifted from just having entered a few years in and I was being asked to do more and more things and I was advancing quickly in my career. And I think it was a moment where I realized, you know, I need to figure out what my leadership style is. And I don't, mm-hmm. I don't see someone in front of me that I can exactly emulate. Because in my head, right, the person I would emulate would have been a woman of color or someone I could really relate to in some sort of personal way. And I had wonderful mentors. Most of my sponsors and mentors have been these amazing white men. But there obviously is something different yeah. about their experience and my own. So I don't know where this came from, but it came to me like I can pick and choose. And I, I even tell women this as I get on stages now, like I looked around and I just started to pick um, aspects of their leadership, different people's leadership yes. that I liked, right? So this person um, opens their office every Friday afternoon and just chats with people, right? That's a really sort of um, uh, community-based leadership. You know, this leader is is very authoritative, you know, authoritative and really does his research and really knows his facts. And, you know, I want to show up and and, and be taken seriously so that I'm going to take those aspects of it. You know, this leader doesn't work on weekends, right? Like I was in a role where you worked 100 hour weeks sometimes, right? And this leader doesn't schedule calls on Saturday morning. So I want to be a kind of leader that respects, right, my, my, my boundaries. And so I looked around and there's probably eight leaders that I chose from. And I remember writing myself an email saying, this is the kind of leader I want to be. So it was a very conscious sort of effort. I'm not, I'm not always like that. So it sounds like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm writing all my forward thinking ideas and I don't, but I, I sat there and I really did think about it. And I think that gave me the permission and I, I still love the word permission, but it gave me the word, the permission to really realize like, I'm not going to see the exact model for me that I'm going yes. to have to piece it together and that there's strength in that and that's okay. And so something shifted for me and um, I, you know, that, that, that phrase, you know, you don't have to see it to be, it really became something I had it on my computer. I taped it on there and I would, I would really, you know, tell myself that. And so that really shifted. I think that was one moment for me. Definitely. And there were I other love things. that. I love that you created that. And that for me is what the power of the only is about. It's kind of seeing that within yourself and then creating that vision, right? And we talked about representation. You did see it, but in different aspects and different things, right? We were looking for, I think it used to be we were looking for role models and the one, right? Right. Or the guru to follow or the mentors to follow. And I think what we're shifting in is that everyone is human. We all have strengths and we have weaknesses. And it's not about trusting in everyone else, but trusting in the power of you to create what's next for yourself, but also having people you admire, having mentors, but it doesn't have to look one way, right? I think there's a fall of even in the uh, personal development space. And I think we all look to mentors as, you know, or celebrities or whatever. They're like these all encompassing beings. And as we dig deeper, we realize that we've all been through journeys. We all have weaknesses and strengths and not to put so many people on a pedestal and actually put our, and it's because that allows, that makes us put ourselves on pedestals too, right? It's kind of like 
being able to see the best in each person and bring that out in ourselves and trusting in what we create. And I think that's what you did is that you took a deep look and said, I trust myself to choose how I want to lead, but I still have role models. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting because there's a few chapters in the book right now that I'm writing and one of them is about shedding and one of them is about carrying. And I think it's really related to what you're suggesting. So for me, I think one of the big messages we need to give women of color is that you can reconstruct, right? You can decide um, if you don't see it, right? You can ex exactly you can just pick what you want. And so the idea of shedding and carrying for me is you need to go through an active process of shedding the messages that don't serve you. I think we get yes. a lot of messages with women of color, whether they're from our communities. So in Indian culture, right? There's a lot of deference to boy children. There's a lot of, you know, women second. There's a lot of, um, um, ideas around family first, which is important, but also again, deference to your husband, which are n nothing I was you know, brought up with, but there was some of that in my extended of family. Of course, yes. Leaving that aside, right? Um, you know, that you can, you know, lead with your voice. That, that is something that you can actually lean to. So there, this idea of that you have to shed things that don't serve you and it's active work. And at the same time, and I think this ties all to, also to this idea of the collective, I think there's so much excitement from where we come from as women of color, right? We come from countries and ethnicities and um, places that carried wisdom. And that wisdom was, was actually shared amongst women in our family. Yet you've, we've come to the United States and there's such a pressure, to, again, to conform and a pressure yeah. to fit let some of that go that we haven't carried that forward and I think part of our um, ability or what we need to do right now as women of color is to go back to that what is the wisdom yes. that we can put aside and so those two pieces I think are what what I'm talking about I didn't know that at the time right I was I was in my early 20s when I did that I, I didn't know that at the time but that's what I was really talking about shed what doesn't serve you and carry forward what really does but lean into who you are I think there's so much of a message of again go be this but I want us to actually lean into our ethnicity, lean into who we yes. are, find that, right? And pull it out. Like, you know, if, if it's been buried for some of us. And I love that you said that. I mean, that's, and I love how you said that you didn't know you were doing it at the time. And this is what I was trying to dissect with the power of the only is I have these principles that I've lived my life by. And now I'm interviewing trailblazers, leaders, and disruptors like you and seeing if there's a through line. You know, I'm, I'm checking myself. And what I'm finding is, yes, there's a truth to that, that we've had it all along and we've been doing it. People that are on the journey of growth, you've done it naturally. And then it's once you've gotten to a place, it's looking back and going, what did I do? How can I help others if they were to ask me, you know, what's the process I went through? And I love that you said about shedding because I think when you're younger, we block things out to succeed. Um, my recent episode was the mask of success. Mm -hmm. And I think as the first, the few, and the onlys, we are people who, who are successful to some degree. You, we've gotten attention because of our success, right? You've risen to the top, but then you have to go back to your life. It's like, what have we let go of? And maybe some of the things that we let go of are our strengths. Right. So my belief is that we already have everything we already need to shine, but now it's a process of letting go of the things that, uh, that don't serve us, like you said, the shedding and bringing that on. And I really feel like it's peeling back the layers. It's not about changing who we are. It's just getting to the core of who we are. Right. That's a lot of my work is helping people get to the core of who they are. And I love that you're highlighting that. What are some of the things that you think you had to shed? Because I tell people, you know, I really unprogrammed myself. Yeah. I love my Chinese heritage. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. so <laughs> proud of being an Asian American. I was never afraid. Well, that's not true. Maybe when I was eight or 10, I, I probably became the cookie cutter. Like don't talk about Asian food, you know, try to dress like everyone else, be like everyone else. Don't, you know, and especially with like Indian food and Asian food, you know, I would hide, hide it. Now yeah. I'm like, here, yeah. want some? <laughs> Sometimes and yeah, that wasn't a good experience for me. <laughs> but I think I stepped into myself um, early on. But I do remember unprogramming the ways of like even being um, like when your when your strength is your greatest obstacle, like right, being humble, not showing up too much, helping others. You know, the Asian culture. I know you can relate with this. So talk about what are some of the things that you felt that you didn't realize were holding you back that you actually had to shed in order to take on the power of the only. Yeah, you know, um, I think at work is where that really showed up for me a lot. And um, I ended up being a really, I made partner very young, right? Mm -hmm. So not only am I a woman and, you know, uh, 
an Indian woman. I'm also 5'1", so I'm little, you know, and um, I made partner young. So it's all these things that made um, what other people thought power looked like or what a partner looked like very different than what I was, right? So not only in my company, but when I would walk into clients, they'd often look around and be like, Where's, who's leaving this? Like, it can't be her, right? Um, and so I think for me, um, one of the things I had to let go of was deference. That was early on, earlier in my career, right? So this idea that I think as Asians, we're taught to be respectful, right? Not speak above people, to listen to our elders. And I had to really encourage myself and I encourage others that I mentor to really find a way to speak up. Again, that, that is comfortable to you. I'm not saying you can change your personality in one day, but you have to find your voice, right? As you're describing. I think that was a big one. I remember a story when I first made partner. So I had just made partner. I was at a new client. I'd sold some work. So they didn't know me well, but you know, yeah. they pitch and I walked in and after the meeting the woman looked at um, the woman that works with me one of my managers and, and they knew each other and I had you know walked out to went, walk to the restroom or something and said to her like why does she always look at her feet when she says she's a partner and I didn't realize it but I had not felt you know I hadn't made the transition of calling myself you know that leader or that title again when you're at one firm like that becoming a partner is a very big deal and yes. that trans calling yourself like now I'm an owner of the company is a huge milestone. And when I would say partner, I'd look down, right? And she's like, what is that about? And that's an example of, I think, confidence, right? And so I really had to work on um, putting that aside. And I, and I literally, this is going to sound so silly and it embarrassed me, but I would say in the mirror, like, I'm a partner. Now. Like, I almost had to practice yeah. that. I didn't believe it myself, right? I, it, I, seen all these partners and in my mind they were so senior and so wise and so many of these other things and so um, those are two examples where I had to put that aside. Um, I think there's also ideas of as I got more senior of just telling people you know um, I remember walking into another client and really just having to say you know I'm I'm the one in charge and I and, you know this is how it is and really kind of finding that voice so that authoritative voice i think is also very hard and comes from culture and and gender a little bit you know that that you know pushing back and how you yes. give feedback and how you um set tone is something i've really had to learn so i think that's the first step though right is that awareness piece is that the first time you even realize that you did look down yeah. like where did that come from yeah, where, where, does that come that, from? <laughs> where does that come from well and as you dig into it, i think you know exactly where it came from you know uh, uh, from our from our backgrounds, from our culture. And that's why, you know, when I worked with my coaching clients, it's really about, you know, they come to me for speaking or they come to me because they want to do a podcast or whatever. And it actually goes way back to when we were younger. We didn't realize that these are the things, the seeds that were planted and doesn't make us less confident. It's just when you're aware that, ah, that is that voice. I do that. I do do that. And now I'm going to stop and I'm going to own all that I am now because I deserve a seat at the table because I know we've worked for it. What, what were the challenges for you? Now let's go dig a little deeper. Cause I, I love how you said that you, you stood up and you had to, had to consciously practice. And that's what I tell people when it comes to speaking. If, if you are listening out there, it's people aren't always naturally speakers or naturally are able to put them out in the spotlight. Some people are, they're just born that way, but most people, it is just like an athlete or whatever, something that you have to work at and you have to notice when you get stuck overcome it and create something new to step into. So what you actually did is it is an actual technique that it's okay. It's not faking it. It's actually just being aware and stepping into something new. But let's talk about some of those challenges. What, what challenges did you face as an only, uh, maybe younger, and how did you overcome them? You know, I, so only only for me started really young. So I grew up in an almost completely white town. Um, mm -hmm. I was maybe one of three people of color in my school. So it was just a rural town in New Jersey, just wasn't diverse at the time. And so there was always this feeling of being different. I played soccer ever since I was the age of four. And I played on the boys team until I was in college um, on one team. Oh, wow. And as the only one. And it's funny, um, not funny, this is a sad part, but I just found out one of my soccer coaches passed away last oh, week. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was thinking about it just because I'm so deep in writing the book um, that, and, and I've never thought about this before, but I never felt, I never faced pushback for being the only girl on the boys' soccer team from my coaches. None of my coaches ever said, 
you're not good enough to be here. I was actually one of the best players always. Um, you're not good enough to be here. And that's, you know, I thank them for that because I never yes. got that limiting belief. But I think I always knew, obviously, I was different, right? When we were at soccer, you know, in, in soccer games or at soccer practice and all the boys were doing boy things, right? And I was kind of like looking at them like, why are they spitting or why are they, you know, <laughs> doing boy things? Um, but it never... Yeah, I guess I was, it also comes from maybe being young. So my, you know, I'm the oldest of two daughters. I, I do tell this story, even though my dad denies it now, but he used to say to us, you know, if I had a boy, they would go cut the, you know, cut the grass or if mm -hmm. I had a boy, he would do this. And I guess that would make me angry. And so I would go yeah. do things, right? It was like motivating. And, you know, looking back, I'm not sure I would want to, you know, I don't have children, but if I, had, you know, if and when, I, I don't, wouldn't want to do that to them. But at the time, I think it was really motivating and it also mm -hmm. changed me this idea that girls did this and boys did this even though that was kind of said yes. I ended up doing everything there was nothing in my household that was gendered right and nothing yes. in how I grew up that was like girls don't do that other than maybe you know spitting and you know dating dating <laughs> in my in my household the parents were very traditionally Indian on that topic but anything short of that there was no there was no boundary and I, I think some of that comes from um what I was taught and how I was allowed to be even back then. Yes. And I love that you brought that up, that even though you had the culture and your dad had that limiting belief, just because that's how he grew up and how he was raised, not that he put it on you, but maybe subconsciously he did a little bit, but you didn't take it on. Yeah. Right. Take it could have gone either way. Right. Yeah. Could have been like, Oh, I'll never be as good as a son. And you know, we, those limit, limiting beliefs, they're there, right? Because they're built into culture. They're built in our situations. We don't always have control over how we grew up or the circumstances or the cities that we grew up in. And I think that's, that's wonderful that you brought that up, that your dad actually empowered you, that what could have been a limiting belief was actually the ability for you to go out and go, no, I'm going to do it differently. And for your coaches that um, see, we grow from our challenges, but we also grow from maybe not having the challenges, right? That it was a natural challenge of you being the only, but I love that your coaches were supportive and allowed you to flourish and just be a good soccer player. Whether it taught me that I could be different, right? Like I saw, so I've always been the only, I've always been different. I've always, and I never really tried to fit in. You know, I've had this conversation with other women, like, you know, do I read, you know, or watch sports on Sunday so I can go in on Monday and talk about football, you know, like, and I've never been one of those people. Like that was just not, not what I did. Yeah. So I never really conformed all that much, but I also, I think it taught me, you can always take the seat at the table and there should be more than one seat, right? That that's a whole different conversation we'll get into. Yes. One seat. I want them. I want multiple seats. Yeah. I want it to be table. But secondly, I think it was, I never felt I couldn't be anywhere. Right. I think yeah. it was for me, my rebellious rebelliousness. And even as a leader, like I've always said what I wanted to say. And at the points where I finally felt like maybe I couldn't, I decided I had other paths to pursue. And I think that's the one thing that I have found in my research. I'm, I'm really, yeah. there's a couple of, couple of points that are really fascinating in my research, but one is um, a lot of women of color feel the pressure to conform is worse as they get higher and they don't know what to do about it. You know, and I think that's fascinating and sad, right? We want leaders to show up in their full voice. And yet what I'm finding is usually there's not because there's a, a certain culture that you're expected to fit in as a leader in, in a lot of um, companies. Again, I'm talking about corporate spaces. Yes. That's yeah. fascinating. That's interesting, right? Because you think that it's that when you're younger, you conform. You know, we all have the story of the early days. I think I stopped that probably by the time I was 12. I kind of just did my own thing <laughs> and I was okay with it. But some people, that journey is later, right? Yeah. But what you're saying is that the research that you found is actually they've overcome all that. They stepped into their power and then it goes back. The curve kind of goes back in the higher levels. Yeah. They're, they believe I'll get to the seat, I'll get to the table and I'll do it my way and I'll bring all these people up, you know, to do it differently. But the pressure on what it, what it means to be a leader, you know, and again, this is, a, you touched on it. A lot of my work is about, we need to redefine power. We need to redefine success, yeah. we need to redefine what has been established as the norm so that we can choose differently. Because I, I don't know that I want those definitions of power or success anymore. I, I've gotten to a place in my life where I don't want that. Like uh, my success yeah. feels now um, and it's taken a long time to get here but I think as a result like the women are expecting to get to the table and they get there and there is more pressure right because again yes. don't you know say these things or leaders don't step in these you know circles or yes. leaders act a certain way don't be too yes. political don't talk about your beliefs right don't talk about religion all these things you don't do and they thought it'd be different when they get there and there's a lot of I think um, 
working through that. And I think it's interesting. You also touched on one other point that I think is so important. Most of the leaders that I have met that I'm really in awe of, and, and they're all amazing women, but there's probably been a 20 that I'm just blown away by, right? Mm -hmm. And Jane, one of them that you met, they all had some life event happen where they found their voice, right? And it was, to your point, I think it was early on usually, but something happens where they just realized, um, and they, had, they haven't articulated this, and I'll be curious if you think this, but I think because they were successful in doing it their way, they subconsciously learned they could and they would survive, right? Yes. I think once you practice that or you're forced to um, put it all on the table, right, and, and potentially walk away from it, it's hard to do that and to go all in and to change, you know, to really push back against a system or push back against something. And all these women had that experience. And so to your point, I think, I think we either need something in childhood or we need some early work event to kind of set the stage for it's okay to push back and to really be you. Otherwise, I think there is a, a, a lot of, you know, trying to figure out and trying to become something you're not. You touched upon, um, well, several things that I want to highlight, but one of them I want to pull out. I think what you just talked about, um, that new research where, you know, people have conformed and then they grew into themselves, they took on the power, they're in that power position, and then they feel the need to conform again. That's mm -hmm. where the new work is. And I believe that's what the new work that we're all diving into is now we got to create, we've gotten the representation a little bit, the yeah. door is open, and now it's creating those new structures and so that those women don't feel that way right? And it's happening. It's happening. We're like, well, what, what is a new way to lead? And even I think with men and other ethnicities, just from working at home, changing the dynamic of what does work-life balance look like? What does working at home, you know, having a life, even, even power structures for the, the current leaders, which are men, right? When those power structures start to go, well, I need to redefine what that looks like for, for me, then it, it shifts the entire structure, right? So it makes it, and I think that's the new conversation. I love that you touched upon that. And then yeah. I do love how you touched upon how um, that event that changes people. And I think that knowing, right? Achieving that one thing and knowing that you can, mm -hmm. right? And it's building upon that. It's like yeah. taking the risk, achieving something like, oh, wow, I did that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then keep going. And I think that's what sets the onlys apart that have achieved success is that we didn't stop is right. that, and that belief. And I love how you talked about that belief of that. I know I can, like, I truly believe in not coming from a conceited place or, but I think it's because I went through so many challenges and I did succeed. And sometimes I didn't, but I know that if I put my mind to something, that I can get into those rooms and I can do what I need to do to succeed. And if it doesn't work out, I know that I'll figure out a way, right. right? I think that that belief in yourself, it doesn't mean I'll do everything perfect. doesn't mean I'll always achieve my goals, but the belief that knowing that you are allowed to, and that you can, yeah. can you talk about that? What is that for you? Like why, where did you get that feeling where I can, I have the power of the only, like, where did that come from? You know, I think it's partly because when I um, joined corporate, I wasn't an MBA. So I was the only one in my 600 person start class that wasn't. Um, I got to policy school. I thought I was going to go into politics. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to be here for a year or two. I'm going to learn some skills and I'll move on. I know, I know that's more, you know, what everyone thinks now when they join the World War Force. When I did, that wasn't, that wasn't the norm. And so as a result, I think um, I always went in like, you know, if this doesn't work out, or if this doesn't, you know, this isn't great, like I'll go do something else. And so I think it was a little bit of, um, I think knowing you have options. I think a lot of us get into situations and feel constrained. And so always knowing you have options, always knowing your worth. Um, again, not something that came easily to me, but knowing, I always felt like I will be okay. I'll land on my feet. And even now, right, I left this amazing career at the height of it, not at the, you know, end of it. I still yes. 20 years left because I really felt called to your point to go do something. And I don't exactly know where the money is going to come from. Even, you know, we just started, I don't know how it's all going to work, but I believe it'll be okay. Um, and so I think for me now it's become a little bit more spiritual, just to be honest with you, when you were mentioned you talking to your husband I and mean, that's how my, I talked to my husband. He like looks at me like, I, I don't know. <laughs> And that's why we need the community. They can recognize brilliance, but they don't get it and it's okay. <laughs> but I think it's a combination of just, um, you know, like I, I've gotten to a place and this is very new and this is um, something I'm really trying to work through in the book. Um, what I do doesn't define me. And I say that, you know, and I would tell you uh, it did define me uh, until very year or two because I gave so much to it. I sacrificed mm -hmm. so much for that only type of job, mm -hmm. right? It's natural, and right? I, it's internal battle you have with yourself. You can say one thing, but we're still programmed a certain way. And we grew up in a, a high level of achievement, 
right? And we, yeah. part of you has thrived on that. Yeah. It is, right? I mean, it, we grew up in cultures, most of us, I can say this, right? Asian culture yeah. of like doing. Right? Yes. It was a, accomplishing doing, moving the ball forward was so important more than anything else, um, at least in the family that I grew up in. And I'm realizing there's such beauty if I slow down. Again, this is very mm. new and something I'm having to reprogram and talk about reprogramming. I don't think you do it once. I mean, I'm, I'm at oh, a yes. constant yeah. yeah, where I'm doing it again. And it's this idea that, you know, the universe comes in and will give you what you need when you need it. And if I just stop and look, like even meeting you is a great example, right? Mm -hmm. I couldn't have planned to meet you, you know, sorted through all my lists. I'm not sure I would have come upon you. But the fact that it came together and I, I chose to go listen to the podcast, right? I think that's the magic of the universe when you're not trying so hard. Yeah. Magic happens. And I don't think we, we, we're not taught that and we need to teach ourselves that a little bit. More. Yes. And I love that. And I feel it right now. I have so much I want to say. And so I'm almost like holding my energy down <laughs> just for you listeners listening out there. It's like, you know, there's so many ways that we can go with that. But when you feel that energy, when it's a, a position, someone you're talking to, a friend that you meet, something that you connect, you have to listen to that. Cause I have that right now. You know, I'm kind of holding it in a little ball because I know that there's a lot that we can distribute. And, um, I also want to talk about what are some of the, you know, you say you don't know exactly those moments of you, um, but what are the three tips that you can give people on how they can harness their power of the only? I think one is, again, that message of leave what doesn't serve you. You get to decide. You're an adult. Like the things you were told as a child, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying you might not have to write about it, go to therapy, do a lot of things about it. But one is like really sort through what happens when you get into difficult situations. Like whose voice do you hear? What mm -hmm. is the message you hear? And does that help you or not? And if it doesn't help you, like write it down and work with people to come up with a plan to put that aside. I think that's one, right? Yes. Um, and I call that, I think you're using similar words, it's like finding your voice, right? Finding yeah. your truth. Like your truth is very different than what you've been taught. Like you get to decide what your truth is. Um, I think the second thing is exercising that voice, right? Uh, we, we touched on it, practicing. Um, these were not things that came easily to me. I still remember being six mm -hmm. and a huge fight with my dad because he wanted me to go back and ask for an extra like a ketchup packet from a fast food place and I was like I just was such a shy <laughs> child to do that right yeah. and we got to fight where he's like how are you going to survive in America if you can't go ask for another ketchup packet you know <laughs> um and so it is practiced for me like I really would ask yeah. for situations of leadership I would really try um, so I think that's the second thing. I think the third thing is, and you've hit on it, and this is what information is about. I think my life has changed in the last two years because I started reaching out to women of color. I didn't know very many women of color that were in corporate spaces because my job took so long and there weren't a lot of us in the circles I moved in. And so I just started reaching out to people on LinkedIn, Raw helped me meet some women, um, and we just started talking, right? And the talking yeah. turned more and to more and to more to the point that we would be on we're on zoom calls now with 40 and 50 women at a time that we don't necessarily know in any way but they've come together and so mm -hmm. i think there is such an importance i call it in finding your mirror there is such an importance in finding other women of color and it's not something i think we've been taught to do it, it, you know we we find community in spaces like in church or in places yes. where you you know, that are organized for us, but we don't organize for ourselves. And I really, the third point is you should just reach out to people. If this, if this last 12 months hasn't taught us anything about what's important in the world, it's that community is important and that yes. you need to find yourself in people that you can really resonate with. And so the third thing is go find people, even if it's two people and you have coffee every Wednesday morning, right? Um, but I think women of color need to find other women of color right now. And I don't think it has to be that complicated, even if it's not a natural thing to do, you know. I love that you, you said that because there's a difference of, um, there's a connection that's an unsaid connection at times. And I've cultivated my life where I know I can fit into any room, right? Because of the skills that you've had working, being the only, when you were younger, being on the soccer team, knowing how to be with the guys, knowing how to stand in your own, right? In corporate, in a very uh, a powerful consulting position. But so I know that I can fit in every room, but there's a difference when you're naturally connected, right? When you, when you feel what's been missing, it's kind of like when we talked about representation, um, we talked about representation before with now all the new um, different dramas or storylines or movies or entertainment that actually have us represented different, different cultures. It's like, you don't know what's missing until you see it. That's an entertainment, but for the community that you're talking about, you don't actually know what's missing until you feel it. 
right? Until you get into those communities, you're like, ah. Whereas I know you can fit in in any community, right? You can fit in and we can, but there's a difference. Yeah, absolutely. There's a difference. I mean, we, we were taught, I mean, I think only, you're absolutely right, are taught to fit in and, and make it work, right? I've, I've been in some of the most elite spaces, um, you know, whether it was school or just meetings or, or um, gatherings. And, you know, I can make it work even if on the inside I'm questioning things. And, and absolutely, we've been taught that. But I also just think it's such a fascinating moment we're in, right? I mean, the yes. summer took down such boundaries. Like I, you know, I was started thinking about my book prior to the summer and I couldn't even say the words racism at work. Like I had to explain, like there had to be like pages and pages about what racism at work is. Yes. Right. And now we're in a place where people understand and you can have that discussion. I'm not saying they fully grasp it, but at least you don't have to explain <laughs> that it is a real thing. And what I think I'm finding with women of color, and we're all, you know, getting at different stages of this, the fact that that wall has fallen and you can talk about things that you believed were happening, but you weren't really sure. There's such a, um, I think it's really important to, to, to just mention this. Like I think as women of color working in corporate spaces or working in the workplace that maybe isn't as diverse, um, there's, a, there's something that happens that's very indescribable. Like I'm, I'm putting my fingers together. Like it's almost like you can't really touch it. Um, it, but it's something, you know that something's not necessarily right. You know, you don't always feel like you belong. You, someone just said something, maybe it's not offensive, but it's not yeah. exactly it's like this confusion that happens all the time. And I think we're in this moment where that confusion, people are saying, you're not confused, it's just wrong, it shouldn't be that way. And mm -hmm. that gives women of color this really important moment where if we can come together and figure out what's next, if we can come together and say, there was trauma and not ha been, having been able to label it before, yes. right? But now we can actually say that was not good for us, that was a microaggression or that was a macroaggression. I think it's a really interesting time. And that's the other reason I think it's so important to find each other. It's, we're in this transition point as you started yes. with, and the transition is strange. Like we're having conversations and letting ourselves feel things we've never allowed ourselves to feel before. And there's importance in having witness to that. That's where I think the, the other women is really. So, so powerful. Um, just to sum up, I know that we're in an evolution based on all the women that you've interviewed and the challenges that you see. What do you think is next besides the community part? What is that next frontier that we need to break through? Or what, what are the, ch the commonalities that you've seen with the women that you've interviewed? What's the next evolution? I think the women are ready. So I think yeah. the next evolution is the changing of structures. I think yeah. we are not going to see power defined the same way. I think we're not going to see success defined the same way. I mean, by the way, you said this, men are asking for change too. Yes. I think we're just in a moment where we cannot keep doing what we have been doing because the world will not allow it, right? The environment will not allow it. It's asking us to ask different questions. And what I'm seeing in a very different way is women of color or women that I'm meeting with, again, just happens to be women of color, these onlys, um, are ready for that and want to step into that. Um, and there is a real sense, you know, I, I think because of the cultures that many of us come from, that our contribution is more than just ourselves, that we yeah. want to give back. And there's a real sense of community and a real sense of um, contribution is so important to legacy for us and so important to our work. You know, yeah. a lot of us don't feel like work is, or success is just getting to the top. It's a genuine feeling that it's more than that. And I think it's, it's exciting to be in this kind of um, transition point where they can step into that and really feel that and be the change, right? I, I think it is going to take our voices because so far we've had the same set of people sitting at the table. And I don't mean this in a bad way, but we're getting the same results. Yes. Uh, Ron and I often talk about the fact that companies are asking for innovation, yet if you don't let people be their whole selves, if women of color aren't really voicing everything they believe and where they come from, are you really getting innovation? Yes. So if these women really speak up, if these onlys can really bring their voice to the table, I think that's how we're going to get change. And it's all, it's almost falling upon us. If we're going to have change, it's not going to come from the same people in the same way. So give us our chance, right? Give me, give us, we call it room and space. Give us room, but give us space. And move, I love you know, that. move away a little bit. Let us go, right? Let our, let our leadership show up in the ways that, you know, we know that it can. And I think the women are starting to believe that. Again, still early, early, but it's exciting to see like the, the, the eyes get big yes. when you talk about it. 
I, I feel it all bubbling up and it's kind of like the convergence of everything, right? Like it's like we have to meet the moment, right? We have to own our power, own our voice, peel back the layers, get to our core. And what you talked about is a constant evolution. I'm still evolving. And I know that we can have a deeper conversation even about that because every time you reach that level of what you reach in your 20s to get to that top spot, now it's a deeper evolution of owning our legacy, how we want to be seen, how we want to show up and not being afraid to once we've gotten in that top spot, still shine, right? Because before there were so many few. And also for the organizations, they're starting to create change. But yet I always ask the organizations that I work with when I consult, do you actually want to create change or do you want me to fill a gap? Do you want me to check exactly. off the box so that you brought in a diversity speaker or a, you know, a training? Yep. And so that's the conversation is that we have to extend it beyond that looks good, right? Doing what uh, looks good for ourselves or looks good. It's like, uh, do we actually want to create change? And I think the conversation has been open and this year it's about taking action. So I'm so honored to have met you and so honored to have heard your story. And I can't wait to hear more about what you create with information. Tell me more about how people can get involved and what they can do if they're interested in uh, information and when does your book come out? Yeah, so if they can come to our website, it's the letter N, the number two formation for getting into formation, n2formation.com. They can sign up and um, there's a vetting process and they can get into our community and we would love to have them. So that's, that's one part. Uh, working on the book now and we are looking at a fall 2021 pub date. So it's very aggressive. Even wow. Though I'm still working. Yes. Uh, so that is what, that's what we're hoping for. So look for me in the fall. Great. And other ways for people to find you, we'll put it all in the show notes, but if you want to talk about it right now. Yeah. And so, um, you know, on social, deepaperu.com is my website, deepa, deepa underscore thoughts on Twitter. Um, I'm big on LinkedIn. That's my favorite because I think um, just my, my, you know, corporate roots, I get to speak a lot. So just look, deep, look up Deepa Prashapaman and uh, you'll find a lot of my book chapters. I'm, I'm asking women questions right now. You know, do, what are you doing? You know, does this resonate? And so if this topic interests you, please please come to LinkedIn and have a conversation with me. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing and the new things that you're creating in the world. It was an honor to meet you and I can't wait to see what else develops. Thank you so much, Deepa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.